Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us, episode 49, Apollo 16, part 2, Exploring Descartes. Last time, we covered the launch of Apollo 16, the first mission to explore the lunar highlands, specifically a region known as Descartes. Originally envisioned as the first of the J missions, 16 wound up being second as schedule pressure moved these extended missions up a bit. Apollo 16's crew John Young, Charlie Duke, and Ken Mattingly had some big questions to answer with their mission. As the first flight to the light-colored lunar highlands, their mission would confirm or refute the standing hypothesis about their origin. Based on orbital photos, geologists expected to learn that the region had been formed volcanically, with syrupy, silica-rich lava. This would contrast with the landscape seen on previous missions, which were formed by massive impacts and the resulting after-effects. The crew would also learn more about the early history of the lunar surface. When the Maria were formed, they melted everything around them, essentially starting from a blank slate. Hopefully the highlands would give the scientists a peek into a time before the formation of the Maria. When we left off last week, John Young had just stepped off the LEM, but let's rewind a few hours. Thanks to a troublesome engine gimbal in the service module, power descent and landing had been delayed by nearly six hours, while engineers on the ground determined if it was safe to proceed. This resulted in Lunar Module Challenger's orbit being slightly high and slightly south of ideal. Once the descent propulsion system was lit and Houston could measure how far off target they would be, the crew received an updated state vector and punched new landing coordinates into the LEM computer. They wound up essentially on the planned approach, but with a little less fuel for hovering once they began the landing phase. The landing site may have terrain that was a little more chaotic than usual, but at least it was easy to pick out. Bracketing the LEM trajectory to the north and south were two craters, appropriately called North Ray and South Ray. Between them were the Cayley Plains, the area the crew would soon be roaming. As Challenger made its final approach, some dust was kicked up, but the ground remained visible. Despite losing some fuel to the orbital corrections, Young had plenty remaining when the contact light illuminated and Charlie Duke exuded, Wow, wild man, look at that! Old Orion has finally hit it, Houston! Fantastic! Duke gets a little excited, but really, can you blame him? Challenger had landed at Descartes 890 feet north and 200 feet downrange of its target. Not bad for something about a quarter million miles away. With the later-than-planned landing, the crew ate a meal and got right into a rest period. One of my sources mentioned something that was another one of these Apollo-era facts that just sort of makes you shake your head. In order to extend the LEM resources a little further, the crew powered it down as low as possible during their rest period. This included turning off, among other things, the mission clock. This could be risky, because if they were unable to re-establish contact with Houston, the only way they would know what time it was would be by using their wristwatches. That might not sound like that big of a deal, but keep in mind that they still needed to return to a precise orbit to rendezvous with Ken Mattingly, piloting the CSM Casper. So this power down could lead to the unlikely but delightfully sci-fi scenario of a couple of astronauts flying home based on nothing more than their personal timepiece. But despite some antenna problems, the crew had no trouble re-establishing contact with Houston when they awoke, and decades of promising wristwatch advertisements never had a chance to materialize. The crew suited up, and Young clambered down the ladder. Duke, eager to get on the surface himself, told Young to hurry up. As I mentioned last time, Young's first words on the surface were, There you are, mysterious and unknown Descartes, Highland Plains. Apollo 16 is going to change your image. Charlie Duke apparently felt obligated to keep up the streak of profound commander first words, goofy LMP first words, and after stepping off the LEM footpad said, Fantastic! Oh, that first foot on the lunar surface is super, Tony! Tony in this case was Tony England, the astronaut on Capcom for that shift. Oh, and space trivia time, Charlie Duke is the youngest person to set foot on the moon. He was only 36 years old when he stepped off the LEM. The crew wasted no time and right away started gathering equipment, setting up the lunar rover, and deploying science experiments. New on this mission was a special camera that could capture specific wavelengths of ultraviolet light. This kind of wavelength is absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere, so this kind of photography is only possible in space. From what I can tell, the camera was basically used to photograph gas in space, 
By pointing it at the Earth, it was possible to learn more about the upper atmosphere and its interaction with the space environment. By pointing it at something like a comet and studying the resulting shape of the gas cloud surrounding it, it was possible to learn about the impact of solar wind on the gas of celestial bodies. You may be imagining this camera as a typical handheld camera, perhaps like the Hasselblad cameras mounted to the astronauts' chests. But no, this was a big, heavy, golden-colored beast that weighed something like 50 pounds. But the one-sixth gravity of the moon can really come in handy sometimes. John Young laughed at how he was able to simply swing the beefy camera over his shoulder. Another science experiment that needed to be set up is one that we're well familiar with now. The heat flow experiment. Ah, the heat flow experiment. Is it possible for a science experiment to be cursed? This was first supposed to fly in Apollo 13, which of course never landed. It finally made it to the surface on Apollo 15, only to be thwarted by a tougher-than-expected landscape. The drill just couldn't bore out the holes required for the heat flow sensors. But science requires patience, and here it was for another try. Charlie Duke manned the drill this time, and either the improved drill did its job, the ground was softer, or both, because he had no trouble. Minutes after starting, he had a nice deep borehole ready to drop some sensors into. He moved on to the second one, but before he could finish, the heat flow experiment confirmed once and for all that it was indeed cursed, when John Young's feet became entangled in the experiment's data cable and yanked it out of its electronics box. With all the cables running around, all of which refused to lay flat in the low gravity, it's actually kind of amazing that it took this long for something like this to happen. But it happened. Duke stopped drilling because with no data cable, there was no point in proceeding. Young felt awful about it, but there was nothing to be done, and time on the lunar surface is precious. The crew got aboard the lunar rover and moved on. The main destination of this first EVA was a large crater known as Flag Crater. Well, really the destination was Plum Crater, a smaller crater in the rim of Flag Crater. Since the walls of Flag Crater were too steep for a rover or astronaut, the idea was to use this natural excavation of the crater walls to learn more about it. The destination was to the west, or down sun, since the sun was still rising in the east on this lunar morning. Young quickly discovered another quirk of working in the lunar environment. When the sun is behind you, it can be pretty tricky to identify craters before they get right on you. Everything just sort of fades into that lunar gray. This also explains why lighting conditions are so important at landing. The crew prefers to have the sun low in the sky so that the craters stand out clearly as they try not to land in one. Once at Flag Crater, the crew began the hunt for volcanic rock. As usual, a crater was the destination because when the crater is formed, it punches through the upper layers of the ground, exposing what lies underneath. And what lies underneath is representative of what the whole area is made out of. So if you can get a piece of the bottom of a crater, you can effectively get the same information as digging deep into the lunar rock. While out there, the crew noticed a large rock about the size of a football. Geologists watching on the TV camera decided that they liked what they saw and asked the crew to bring it back. Weighing in at 26 pounds, the rock wound up being the largest single sample returned on any of the lunar missions. The crew named it Big Muli after the geologist team lead Bill Mulberger. As the crew headed back to Challenger and the EVA wound down, Duke hopped off the LRV to film Young driving around in order to gather some engineering data as to its performance or as the crew called it, the Grand Prix. As a Formula One fan and space nerd, the idea of a Lunar Grand Prix sounds pretty good, though the aerodynamics team might not like it very much. Duke kept the camera trained on Young as he drove back and forth at varying speeds and exhibited the handling and braking qualities of the vehicle. It's pretty funny hearing Duke egg Young on while Young just tries to keep all four wheels on the ground. Okay, turn sharp. I have no desire to turn sharp. Okay, Max, stop. I don't want to do that. Come on, John Young, let loose a little. The crew climbed back up the ladder at the end of a seven-hour EVA, with everything but the heat flow experiment going great. There was just one thing nagging at both astronauts as well as the geologists. All of the rocks so far had been breccia, byproducts of large impacts. Not one rock that could be safely called volcanic had been spotted. Hmm... While the crew slept, engineers on the ground got to work trying to save the heat flow experiment. 
They believe that the data cable had been sheared off at its connector, so it wouldn't be as simple as just plugging it back in. They came up with a plan that involved the crew bringing the experiment back into the LEM, separating the cables, and then stripping off the insulation using an abrasive. Then, they should be able to plug the wires back in, bring the whole apparatus back outside, and continue on. Oh, and the abrasive they had in mind? Moon rocks. Because why not? The plan seemed feasible, but at the end of the day, it just couldn't be justified. The heat flow experiment was important, but the time required to maybe fix it was time that would be taken away from other experiments. And while the heat flow experiment would fly again on Apollo 17, this was the last time NASA planned on going to Descartes. So, bummer. EVA-2 began, and the crew hopped aboard their trusty lunar rover again and headed off to the south. Their destination this time was Stone Mountain, south of the Lem and east of South Ray Crater. The goal, as usual, was to find some volcanic rock. But not just any rock. Ideally, they wanted pieces of Stone Mountain itself. The LRV made its way up the slope, and before they knew it, the crew was over 500 feet above the Cayley Plains. This set the altitude record for all six surface missions. Once up there, it became apparent that it was tricky to tell which rocks were made from Stone Mountain and which were simply pieces of South Ray that had been blasted up there. While pieces of South Ray were certainly interesting, they wouldn't tell geologists about the formation of Stone Mountain. John Young had a clever idea. The mountain, like everything else on the moon, was covered in small craters. He figured that rocks flying from South Ray would land in those craters on the side furthest from South Ray. He figured that the close side would sort of be in a rock shadow and should probably only contain local rocks. With that in mind, he made sure to grab some samples from these small crater slopes. As Young and Duke got ready to head back down Stone Mountain, they had plenty of samples and some pretty spectacular photographs, but still no volcanic rock. Was the volcanic hypothesis wrong, or were the astronauts just not looking hard enough? When the crew climbed up the ladder again, it was to an increasingly ripe lunar module. As you'll recall, on Apollo 15, the surface crew, especially Jim Irwin, showed some alarming heart activity. NASA speculated that this was at least in part due to the low levels of potassium in their diet. To prevent a repeat of that scary moment, Houston had our intrepid duo pounding down as much orange juice as possible. While still in lunar orbit, Duke had his microphone boom pressing into his OJ drink valve in his helmet, and a big blob of it emerged in the microgravity environment. It then wicked its way up the mic boom and into the Snoopy cap that the crew wore under their helmets. So poor and Charlie Duke spent the rest of the mission with gross orange juice hair. In addition to that, the citrus fruit meant to protect their hearts also seemed to be affecting their gastrointestinal tracts. This became all too clear in a pretty hilarious moment when John Young accidentally left his microphone broadcasting while on board the LEM. He said to Duke, I got the farts again. I got them again, Charlie. I haven't eaten this much citrus fruit in 20 years. And I tell you one thing, in another 12 expletive deleted days, I ain't never eaten any more. A frantic Capcom finally got John Young's attention, informing him that he had a hot mic. Young simply responded, How long we had that? After another rest period, the crew again got ready to hit the dustiest of roads and headed to North Ray Crater. One thing that always strikes me with this kind of stuff is how long it can take to do the basics. On some of these EVAs, these lunar surface EVAs where time is so precious, the crew might spend an hour gathering equipment and loading it into the LRV. I'm sure there was no other way, but it must have been a killer to the crew, eager to get as much done as possible. Anyway, North Ray. This large crater was about 650 feet deep, so it certainly made a mark on the landscape. With that much of Descartes torn up, there just has to be some volcanic rock out here, right? Right? Well, we'll see. The crew parked the LRV and headed to the rim of the large crater. It turns out that crater rims like this aren't quite as sudden and drastic as they can sometimes appear, so the crew just got sort of close to the rim, where the landscape gets steeper and steeper before a pretty sharp drop, and gathered some samples there. The astronauts weren't geologists, but they had been through a lot of training, and so far all they were seeing was breccia. <laughs> 
With this last EVA, they were really looking hard for anything that could help confirm the volcanic hypothesis. While the crew were gathering samples from the rim of North Ray, a large boulder caught the eyes of folks watching the video feed on the ground, and that was soon the crew's next destination. But distances can be misleading on the moon. What looked like a large boulder kept growing and growing and growing as the crew approached it. When they finally arrived, they discovered it was about as tall as a four-story building. So, of course, it became known as House Rock. House Rock was almost certainly a big piece of debris from the North Ray impact, so it could be the scientists' saving grace or the final nail in the coffin for their theory. The crew gathered some samples, but as they looked it over, they declared the one thing the scientists did not want to hear. It was one giant breccia. That was basically it for the volcanic hypothesis. When the crew climbed up Challenger's ladder for the last time, it was at the end of over 20 hours of extravehicular activity on the lunar surface. That's about eight times longer than Apollo 11, for those of you keeping track at home. With them, they had over 200 pounds of lunar samples, including Big Mully, the single biggest lunar rock recovered in the Apollo program. Other than the heat flow experiment, it had been an incredibly successful flight. 70 hours after touching down, Challenger blasted off again, with its ascent engine performing flawlessly for a one-revolution rendezvous with Casper. After a successful docking, NASA made one more tweak to the schedule. On Apollo 15, after docking, the crew worked for several hours to transfer all equipment and close out the LEM. With Jim Irwin's heartbeat still ringing in their ears, and with the altered schedule caused by the earlier engine troubles, Houston decided to let the crew rest before LEM closeout. But in a perfect illustration of why last-minute schedule changes can be tricky, after the crew woke up and the time came to jettison Challenger, they forgot something. Among the myriad switches on board, they left one in the wrong position and prevented Houston from remotely controlling the spacecraft. This meant that instead of being intentionally crashed into the surface to feed the seismometers, the LEM remained in lunar orbit for nearly a year before orbital perturbations finally brought it down. Whoops. Like Apollo 15, 16 would also deploy a small subsatellite from the service module SIMBAY. But unlike 15, they would not use the SPS to first raise their orbit. With the backup gimbal system still suspect, it was decided to only use the large engine for the critical trans-Earth injection. The result was that the sub-satellite was deployed considerably lower than planned. It also turns out that unbeknownst to the mission planners, the chosen orbit was highly unstable due to its orientation with respect to the mass concentrations in the moon. The uneven gravity field quickly got to work tugging the orbit this way and that, and only 35 days after deployment, it crashed into the lunar surface, half the planned mission duration. In further deference to the engine trouble, the stay in lunar orbit was also cut short by one day. According to Chaikin, Mattingly didn't really see a technical reason for this, and figured that management was just getting nervous and wanted them home as soon as possible. When the time came to fire up the engine, it worked with no issues at all. Better safe than sorry, though. Especially in lunar orbit. On the way back, Ken Mattingly joined an exclusive club of just three people to perform a deep space EVA. The brief spacewalk was basically the same as Apollo 15's, with Mattingly making his way down the side of the service module to retrieve film from the specialized cameras in the side of the spacecraft. It seems that, like Warden, he also wasn't given a camera for this EVA. Which is a real shame, because I want to see that shot of the LMP sticking his head out of the hatch with the moon framed behind him. Oh well. A few days later, the crew strapped in, the service module was jettisoned, and Casper oriented itself to the entry attitude. Slamming into the upper atmosphere at just shy of 25,000 miles per hour, it left a trail of ionized gas in its wake. 12 days, 2 hours, 37 minutes, and 6 seconds after lifting off, Apollo 16 splashed down. The mission was over. But what of the volcanic hypothesis? The motivating factor for landing at Descartes in the first place? Well, it was wrong. Bummer, mission wasted, right? No way. This is science doing exactly what it's supposed to do. Science isn't about confirming that you're right. Right. 
It's about probing the universe to find out what's true. The geologists were completely wrong about the formation of Descartes. But that's not a bad thing. Science draws the best conclusions it can from what it can observe and test. When studying the orbital photos, volcanic activity seemed like the most likely origin. With new information, the theory changed. We learn most when we're wrong, and that applies to scientists just like everyone else. Next time, the end is in sight. Apollo 17 will be the last lunar landing of the Apollo program. But it won't all be lasts, we'll also get some firsts. Throughout this episode, I mentioned the geologists watching on the TV feed. Wouldn't it be great if they could just look around for themselves? Next time, we'll meet the first, and to date only, scientist to walk on the moon, Harrison Schmidt. Ad Astra, catch you on the next pass. <laughs>